I'm very educated in, in the health care of a child with spina bifida that you just you learn your child and what their needs are and, and some decisions come easier than others. In some ways, to look at the bright side, the kids have it when they're born and have the opportunity to adjust immediately in life and through their entire life. It'll all come with time. It's just steps of their life and, and they'll, you'll start out thinking they're never going to reach that point and then one day they're going to wake up and they're going to take that responsibility. It's normal for us, but at the same time, it's not normal. For our family, it is a challenge we have day after day after day. It is a challenge we have always. You learn how to care for them and their, their other needs and the decisions that you make. I think as they get older, they help you make them. And you have a, usually a very good medical team behind you helping you make those decisions. Okay, so tell me what spina bifida is. Can somebody give me a short statement about what spina bifida is? What do those words mean? Practice on me. Spina is spine and bifida is open. So basically, spina bifida just means open spine. Good, very good. So it's really good to practice those words so that you have your own set line for answering that you're very comfortable with. And so you can Spina bifida, of course, is a defect in the development of the spinal cord in children. It's of concern to us because the nerves which control the function of the bladder are almost always involved in the problem. The spinal cord does not close uh, in utero when the baby is growing, when the fetus is growing and developing. It requires the neurosurgeon to do some surgery to it at the time of the child's birth and it leads to a variety of uh, abnormalities in the neurological function of the child. A spinal bifida affects it, really the entire central nervous system, uh, including both the spinal cord and the brain. I guess the not so clinical answer would be it's a, it's a challenge like any other challenge that we are given in, lives, in our lives and um, this one happens to be a physical challenge. At each stage in our lives, there is a bridge to be crossed. From infant, toddler, young child, teenager to adult, from preschool through the educational years to job training or college, from living at home, going to work, to becoming a member of the community. For children with spina bifida and their families, it's no different. Their hopes and dreams for crossing these bridges successfully are just like everyone else's. Today, you will meet several families whose roadmaps started out just like yours and who are now successfully crossing one bridge at a time. The first year was difficult for us because we knew about the disorder, spina bifida, but we didn't know what to expect. We were very scared, um, very nervous. Uh, the first thing we did was go to the library and try to find as much information as we could. Time was passing and we were learning what it meant, the consequences. But it is with the hospital's help that we will come through this together all of us working together. With Megan, it has affected her um, bladder and her bowels. When she was developing her spine, it didn't close all the way and it caused nerve damage. She has very little feeling on the bottom of her feet. Thank you. Thank you. Spina bifida is a complicated disorder that many people find hard to explain. Put simply, spina bifida means split spine. It occurs during the first month of pregnancy when the neural tube is developing. This tube develops into the brain and spinal cord. Spina bifida occurs when it doesn't form typically. Insufficient folic acid in the mother's diet is one of several reasons why spina bifida may occur, leaving a section of vertebrae and skin undeveloped. Spina bifida is the number one cause of infantile paralysis in the world today, but I think 
more importantly to the families, it's a congenital birth defect that's going to have lifelong impact, not only on the child, but the family themselves. I think last time we were here, he couldn't use the walker all the time. He's made a great amount of progress, but it's still just that. There are different types of spina bifida, and the effects vary with each child and each condition. The most significant form of spina bifida is known as myelomeningocele. During normal intrauterine growth, the spinal cord starts out as a flat plate of cells, and then it closes into a tube. And then when it closes, then the membranes over the spinal cord close, and the bone closes, and the muscles, and the skin. So if the spinal cord stays open, then none of the other structures close either. So with spina bifida, the structures are open. Unlike an open myelomeningocele, another form of spina bifida, lipomyelomeningocele, occurs where the skin is intact and the spine is not exposed. The closed skin covers a collection of fat called a lipoma, which causes the spinal cord to be stuck underneath the skin. Children born with a lipomyelomeningocele need much the same care as those born with a myelomeningocele. Both forms of spina bifida feature a lump on the back. It's just that one is open and one is closed. Spina bifida occulta occurs when the bones of the spinal column aren't completely developed, but the underlying nerve tissue is usually normal. There may be some dimpling on the back or some significant marking. Even though this usually doesn't cause medical problems, the individual should still be evaluated. I think what ends up being the most challenging part of working with children with spinal bifida is that some will have uh, almost no identifiable problems where some will be very complicated and have multiple medical uh, issues. The causes of spina bifida are varied and differ from case to case. Scientists believe that genetic and environmental factors may cause the condition. Researchers have discovered that when women take folic acid before becoming pregnant and during the first trimester, 50 to 70 percent may reduce their risk of spina bifida. Folic acid is a water-soluble B vitamin. There are prenatal tests that may be performed to detect spina bifida. These tests may not detect every child with spina bifida, but can assist healthcare professionals in counseling parents prior to the birth of their child. Today, Coleman plays basketball, wheelchair basketball. He does kung fu. Um, he uh, has guitar lessons, um, he's learning how to play a musical instrument, and very, very active child. I remember being uh, in the hospital quite a bit with him, um, and that was kind of a way of life for us that first year. Our lives pretty much revolved around spina bifida and, and helping Coleman and making sure he was well and well cared for and, and treated and every little medical need that he had was met. And I think that first year, is a, it's an exhausting year because you're so worried. In that first year, Melanie soon discovered the decisions surrounding her son's care were only just beginning. And with each decision, she learned that they were laying the foundation for Coleman to better succeed in crossing life's bridges along the way. This is an ongoing process. It's a lifelong process. And the issues that come about that uh, affect that life and the expectations in life uh, happen at various ages and at different stages in the child's life and in the family's life. What we hope to try to do in impacting those life expectations is to help the families come to informed decisions in those choices as it relates to medical, educational, social, personal decisions that come and come again and come again. Spina bifida primarily affects the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and those systems that rely on it for coordinated functions such as the bowel, bladder, swallowing, growth, and skin, to name a few. With the interruption in the development of the spinal cord, 
Messages that normally travel up and down the spine to the brain do so differently or not at all. There's a break in communication from the nerves in the affected body systems to the brain. The tendency is to think of uh, body systems affected in terms of motor and movement in muscles and bones. The issue with spina bifida is it starts before birth and it starts with the, the nervous system as well as the bone system. What is your definition of almost healed? More than this, okay. <laughs> and because of the nervous system involvement, um, you then begin to branch out to many other organ systems and many other body systems. Uh, bowel, bladder uh, come to mind. But there's also issues of skin uh, when there are areas where you have lack of sensation from lack of nerves. That affects um, the uh, potential injury for skin, for example. Treatment for children with spina bifida involves a team of physicians and health experts partnering with the family to bring about the best care possible. The goal of this interdisciplinary approach is to provide roadmaps for both the child and family in crossing each developmental bridge in life within the same program in the same clinic area. We try to bring in an interdisciplinary or a transdisciplinary team. This can involve physical therapy, occupational therapy, therapeutic recreation, dietary, child life. It typically involves orthopedists, neurosurgeons, pediatric urologists, neurodevelopmental pediatricians. There are orthotists and braces. As you can see, there is a wide and, and deep team of people uh, that are put together to try to provide the support services for the kids. As he walks, this foot turns in quite a bit still. Mm -hmm. and I guess Families begin coming to spina bifida interdisciplinary clinics at different starting points. Some begin in the prenatal months, others once the baby is born, depending on the services available locally. For a baby with spina bifida, the evaluations, decisions, and surgeries all begin at birth. The first step, neurosurgery to close the open spinal cord. We usually like to close the defect within about 24 to 48 hours on these children in order to reduce some of the complications such as infection that can incur. About 85 to 90 percent of babies with myelomeningocele, they'll have hydrocephalus, cerebral spinal fluid building up inside the ventricles, inside the cavities of the brain, that will require a tube called a shunt to be put in. The shunt takes the spinal fluid from the brain and delivers it to somewhere else in the body, where it can be absorbed into the bloodstream, most typically to the abdominal cavity. That's called a ventriculo peroneal shunt. It goes under the skin, you can't really see it, and it's made out of a special flexible tube made out of a material called cytostic. Okay? There you need uh, a couple incisions, one on the head, sometimes one here, and one in the abdomen. In the children that do have ventriculoperitoneal shunts, they require revision at a rate of approximately 50% every five years. So we like to educate the families on the signs and symptoms to look for if the shunt stops working. The most common symptoms are headache and vomiting. And we thought, okay, if we can make it six months without surgery, we'll be doing good. And then we made it six months, and then we made it a year, and now it's been six years since he's had surgery. So, you know, we, it, it becomes a lot easier to deal with as time goes on, and the decisions that you make, I think as they get older, they help you make them. You know, and they're able to communicate more what's going on with their own bodies, and they can, they can help in those decisions too. But as a parent, I think when they're younger, you're so worried every time they cry that their shunt's not working, or every time they're more sleepy than they usually are. It's not, you know, you're worried that your first thought is that it's their shunt that's malfunctioning. Spina bifida's effect on the nervous system is complicated. It's important to understand that surgery to close the opening in the baby's back does not repair damage to nerves. 
And for a newborn baby, sometimes the only symptom to know whether or not they have hydrocephalus is that the head is large or that it's growing too fast. So a CT scan or MRI may be necessary. In addition, the brain in most children with spina bifida is positioned lower down into the spinal column than it should be. This positioning is known as Chiari II malformation. It affects the cerebellum, which controls balance, movement, and coordination, and the brainstem, which controls breathing, digestion, and circulation. Individuals with open spina bifida not only have hydrocephalus, but almost all of them have something called the Chiari malformation. The hindbrain extends down through the skull and is compressing on the brainstem and the upper portion of the cervical canal and the cervical spinal cord. And this can produce symptoms such as swallowing difficulties, choking and gagging on food, speech difficulties, hoarseness, neck pain, arm and leg difficulties, even referred pain to other areas such as pain up around the head. If these symptoms are progressive in nature, the Chiari II malformation may require surgery. However, this condition can be present and not be symptomatic. If you're not off, there you go. Right there. It is important to note that as all brains are physically different, so are the intellectual strengths and weaknesses. The developmental differences related to the Chiari II can be associated with a wide variety of learning differences and learning challenges that will affect the child with spina bifida throughout his or her life. Another neurological condition that may occur in children with spina bifida is tethered cord. Typically, this happens during childhood or adolescence as opposed to infancy. A tethered cord is caused when scar tissue from earlier surgeries attaches to nerve tissues in the back. The best remedy is early identification and surgery to release the cord back into position. So just about every child with a myelomeningocele has something that is called a tethered spinal cord. In a myelomeningocele child, that spinal cord is attached up into the soft tissues of the back. When we do an initial release, that, that spinal cord will be released and be allowed to flop back into the spinal canal and will no longer be tethered. But as time goes on, that spinal cord will come back and adjacent to the tissues and it will scar and attach to the tissues. That is called a tethered spinal cord. We've discussed how spina bifida affects the central nervous system. Next, let's talk about the kidneys, bladder, and bowel. When nerves are damaged to the bladder, not only may you have problems urinating, but you may have problems storing the urine too. It's often useful to compare a typically functioning bladder to a neurogenic bladder. That is one where the nerves to the bladder don't transmit properly. Here's how the bladder normally works. Well, your bladder has two functions. We think of it when we urinate, but we only urinate a few times a day for a few moments. So most of the time, the bladder is storing urine. And so the function of the bladder, first off, is to store urine at a volume that allows you to go to the bathroom on a regular basis, but not to spend your life going to the bathroom. That Urine has to be stored in the bladder in a sufficient volume for a sufficient length of time to be comfortable for your life, but it also has to be stored at a low pressure to protect the kidneys. And so those are important issues that urologists look at. Now, periodically, when it's time to empty your bladder, of course, we go urinate, and then the nerves contract to push the urine out. But this typical automatic coordination only occurs on average in three to four of every 100 children with spina bifida. The nerves that are impacted by spina bifida are variable, and so when you just look at several children who all have a similar problem with spina bifida, they all have a problem in their low back, each of those kids may have a slightly different pattern of what's been affected by the abnormal nerves. So you may have one child whose bladder has very low pressure, 
but the opening is weak and urine just leaks out of it and so they never really hold urine very good and they just dribble out. You may have another child whose opening is closed tightly and the bladder doesn't relax as urine comes in and the pressures go up and cause blockage to the kidney. This doll Bandit is a very special doll because it, he allows us to see inside. And so in to achieve independence and give children control over when they need to urinate, they are taught at an early age how to use a catheter. The goal is to prevent urinary tract infections and keep from damaging the kidneys through abnormal backflow of urine. But for the occasional child who already in infancy has a higher pressure bladder, we might start catheterization to empty the bladder regularly so that we keep the pressures low. We want to intervene to prevent further damage. At first, yes, I was having a little hard time um, going and catheting because I would not want to go wrapped in because, you know, I'd be in the middle of something. So I'd put it off and put it off and put it off, but now that boys and friends and school's gotten into the picture, I've actually been doing pretty well. Hola, como están? Están bien, bien, otros doctores. Menos a la hora y media, notamos que ya el baño nos puso la vez pasada. Various tests may be conducted to determine the best course of treatment for bladder and kidney problems. These tests range from a simple ultrasound scan to a more complex test called a urodynamics test. A urodynamics test looks at pressures in the bladder to see how well the bladder empties and how well the bladder is protecting the kidneys. High pressure in the bladder may cause reflux, urine forced back up into the kidneys, which in turn causes kidney damage. Sacral nerves carry messages to and from the bladder as well as the bowel. And just as with the bladder, children can't tell when they need to move their bowels. The Spina Bifida team works with individual families to determine the appropriate bowel program to help their children achieve continence. The location for the nerves that go to the bowel are at the very, very bottom of the spinal cord in the sacral area. And most uh, everybody with spina bifida has the interruption in the spinal cord above that. So that the nerves from the rectum to the brain never get through because of the interruption in the spinal cord. And the brain can't ever send a message back down that says, hold it and go to the bathroom. So there's no communication and that's why um, people with spina bifida have to have um, more of a timing program than um, being aware of when they're getting ready to have a bowel movement. Just as these children can't tell when they need to move their bowels, they can't always control the process of having a bowel movement. Food tends to move more slowly through the digestive tract of children with spina bifida. This may cause constipation. Fiber is very important. Fiber is in all plant sources, and that includes whole grains as well as fruits and vegetables. And fiber is very important in kind of helping the stool bulk and retaining the moisture in the stool so that the stools won't be hard and dry for constipation. Preventing constipation is the first step towards achieving bowel continence. And there are a number of ways to do this, managing diet through a balance of fruits, vegetables, and fluids, and managing elimination medically through the use of products such as suppositories, enemas, and stool softeners. Because the nerves going to the bladder and the bowel are physically located close together, achieving total continence involves them both. Learning how to manage this area at the bottom of the spinal cord starts in infancy and may continue into young adulthood. What do you usually have for dinner? Pasta? Okay. It takes the Spina Bifida team together with the child's family to assist the individual in achieving success and becoming more independent in this area of his or her care. Okay, let me tell you, she's had CTs and MRI scans that are completely normal. Mm -hmm. You look at here, 
Thus far, we've seen the effects of nerve changes in the brain, the bladder, and the bowel. Next, we examine how spina bifida affects the muscles and bones. The orthopedic surgeon is pretty much a consultant in the many, many different physicians that are required to treat spina bifida. We're not the primary coordinator, but we're a consultant. She's two years out from her spinal fusion. She's an anterior and posterior. And with that, we deal with the muscles and the skeleton portion of the children. The underlying problem with spina bifida, as you alluded to, is, is really not with the feet or the ankles or the orthopedic aspects of the bones of the joints, but a result of the muscles not working, which is really a result of the spinal cord and the nervous system. Because nerves below the level of the abnormally developed spinal cord do not grow or perform properly, muscles in the lower portion of the body often become imbalanced. This means muscles on one side of a joint may be very strong, while on the other side may be very weak. This muscle imbalance affects a child's ability to walk and remain mobile, often requiring bracing at an early age. Usually between when the children are between one and three years of age, as they get to be developmentally to the point where they're ready to pull to a stand, is to make sure the lower limbs are in a position that they can get in braces to help facilitate them standing and walking. Uh, we talk about the neurologic level that children with spinal bifida have, and the higher the level of the children in the thoracic spine, the less motion they have in their legs. When the children are young and small, uh, we can make we can make almost any child walk with a, with enough bracing. As a child develops gross motor skills, the orthopedic surgeon evaluates the individual's need for braces, a walker, a wheelchair, or even surgery. Developmental milestones come at different ages and stages for each child, thus affecting decisions on what is best to keep the individual mobile and moving towards independence. And so they may not be pulling to a stand and crawling and walking at the same times as their non-neurologically involved peers, if you will. Um, but once they're to that point developmentally, and that's a neurologic milestone, then the orthopedic surgeons will be involved to help get the limbs in a position that is braceable. And if your child's hips are dislocated, what's the best course of treatment? It's a subject that's generated a lot of research and differing opinions on surgical intervention. Most kids with a dislocated hip who have spina bifida are probably best left with that dislocated hip. Surgery which is done to make the hip into a reduced position can be done, and it's been done over and over again. But the muscles that we talked about earlier are often not balanced correctly, and surgery which is performed and technically done, done well may not permanently last, and the hip becomes dislocated again, for example. Uh, as time has gone on, we found that the function of the child probably doesn't vary a great deal if the hip is dislocated or if the hip is in the socket. Uh, the sole exception to that certainly is a child who has very mild involvement, and in those conditions we want the hip to be in the socket because they function nearly normally. But in general, we leave the hips dislocated if they present that way. A child with spina bifida can also have multiple differences in the development of his or her spine. These differences may be mild to severe and may or may not require surgery. A gibbous is a very prominent bump on the patient's back. And it's there because the spine is misshapen. It almost has a right angle, if you want to think of it that, from the side. So if you look at the child from the side, and you look at their back, you see a bump that is in the lower portion of their back. And that's from a, a malformed spine. And many of those kids will do okay throughout life with that. Their posture won't be great, but they'll be fine and they'll be uh, getting around very successfully in a wheelchair. Most of the children who have a gibbous have significant involvement with their spina bifida. Scoliosis is a curvature of the spine, so if I'm looking straight at a child who has spina bifida and I see that their spine is bent or their posture is crooked, then that's generally scoliosis. Uh, it is not when you're looking at the side of the patient. 
which is a gibbous, which we had just spoken about, but scoliosis is when they have a curvature of the spine. We see a lot of, children's, uh, a lot of children who have scoliosis in spina bifida, and it's usually a neurologically related problem, meaning that their spina bifida has led to the development of scoliosis. Occasionally the kids are born with scoliosis, in which the spine is misshapen in itself, but usually it develops as time goes on. In those kids, uh, if it doesn't become too severe, we just can watch that. We don't brace them very often, but on occasion we do. And on occasion we need to operate on these kids. And if we do, we generally fuse their spine from their upper back all the way down to their pelvis. And we do that in an effort to help give them a better sitting posture, something that will last through their lifetime, and provide them with a spine that serves them well through life. Just as undeveloped or damaged nerves affect the muscles in the lower body, they also cause differences in the sensation or feeling in an individual's skin. This often leads to wounds and pressure sores. How's it look? For example, Megan isn't able to feel when dirt and sand rub a sore on her foot, and this causes concern for her mother. She has a wound on the bottom of her foot, and she has very little feeling, and she wants to be like all the other kids and wear flip-flops and the sandals, and her ankles just won't hold it. Her ankles are weak, and her ankles won't hold the support of sandals, and, and the flip-flops allows dirt to get up underneath there, and it's like sandpaper on the bottom of her feet, and it just rubs that wound. Pressure sores and wounds may occur on various parts of the body and may be caused by a variety of things. They may appear where braces consistently rub part of the leg, or on the buttocks from sitting in a wheelchair and not changing positions over an extended period of time, or along the shoulders, again from not shifting positions in a wheelchair. With any kind of wounds, it's very important to check your skin every day. If your feet have differences in sensation, which most people with spina bifida do, you need to be wearing shoes at all time when you're outside. You need to have, if you use a wheelchair, you need to have shoes on all time when you, at all times when you're sitting on your wheelchair. And um, daily skin checks for looking at any kind of red areas or breaks in the skin. If you think you have a wound, the most important thing is to try and figure out what caused it. Is it your brace? Is it something with your wheelchair? And try and eliminate the pressure point and watching for red areas that don't go away in 20 minutes. We've discussed the medical aspects of spina bifida and how it affects the various body systems. Just as important is how the physical and intellectual differences lead to challenges in learning and the adaptation to various environments, such as home, school, and the community. And because of this, physical, occupational, and recreational therapists are key members of a child's interdisciplinary team. They play an important role in assisting these individuals to cross bridges which lead to greater independence in daily living. Physical therapy assists patients from the very beginning of their life all the way through the lifespan. An occupational therapist will also assist the family much in the same way. They are very focused on functional goals that involve life skills such as eating, dressing, um, using the restroom, um, grooming, so taking a bath, um, personal hygiene, things of that sort. One of the most important things for a child to do is play. That's how they learn when they are very young. So physical, occupational, and recreational therapists work together with the family and set functional goals related to play. Functional play then leads to more functional activities and new goals. Good pass. Quisiera decir que él ahorita because we have been teaching him how to do things by himself. Right now he doesn't need me to help him take a bath. Everything else he can do by himself. Getting dressed, for example. 
The only thing he needs help with is putting on his shoes. Well, everything else he can do by himself. He knows when to get dressed, when to take his medicine. I'm not going to be worried because I know he can do things. He knows how to do everything I can. I can leave him two or three days out of the house. I'm not going to be worried because I know he can do things. Physical and occupational therapists also act as advocates for children within the school system. They may need um, some kind of assistive technology, whether it is a different kind of writing utensil or some other type of assistive technology to make them be successful. And so physical and occupational therapists can serve a valuable purpose making sure that the children are successful, not just in getting through the school day, but in meeting their academic needs as well. In the past, children with spina bifida have been stereotyped and lumped together in regards to their intellectual capabilities and physical development. Today, we are learning more and more about the differences from child to child. It's important to know that there are developmental aspects that contribute to the learning styles and skills of each individual with spina bifida, which in turn impacts how they adapt to various environments. Every child with spina bifida does have a unique learning profile. A child with spina bifida may have one combination of learning issues that impact school, that impact home, and that impact how he deals with doctors and nurses. And another child with spina bifida may have a completely different set of learning issues that again impact home and community. So um, as parents and professionals working with these children, it becomes incumbent upon us to try and identify those individual strengths, to identify those individual weaknesses, and then tailor our intervention to that individual child. Learning issues include difficulty with attention and memory, organizing information, and problem solving. Children with spina bifida often have differences in their language skills, some of which can be misleading. First question, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Children with spina bifida speak really well. They use big words, they use well-articulated, grammatically correct sentences, and, and we think that language is a strength. But unfortunately, what happens is sometimes we miss the fact, and this wonderful speaking language masks the fact that these children oftentimes have difficulty understanding language. And particularly, they seem to have trouble with um, abstract words and abstract terms. And by that, what I mean is terms that don't have a visual reference. For example, if I say box, in our mind's eye, we can see a box. But if I say words that describe distance or quality or quantity or time and space, these are words that we don't really have a visual reference. And some examples um, would be near, far, after, before, except for, instead of. These words can be quite problematic um, for some of these children with spina bifida. Temperament differences in children with spina bifida also affects their ability to learn. Studies over the past 20 to 30 years indicate that some of these differences prevent children from interacting optimally with others in their environment. The trick is not to stereotype all of these issues, learning, language, and temperament. Each impacts a child's ability to interact at school, to engage in the community, and to put themselves out there in activities with other kids. Otherwise, these behaviors too often encourage social isolation and time alone. Therapeutic recreation has been incredible helping us learn what Coleman can do. Therapeutic recreation specialists work with children and their families to assess an individual's interests and abilities and then match those to the resources available in their community. Recreational activities not only encourage fitness and well-being, but they're important in helping children with spina bifida improve self-esteem and become active participants in life. They get a sense of belonging, a sense of belonging to a group, sense of accomplishment. Uh, they increase self-esteem. Um, 
it's amazing sometimes to me see some of the children that participate in the wheelchair basketball um, team how they grow within their independence and their independence in transferring themselves and their independence of their own personal skills because they're part of a group. Oh, nice. This sense of independence is not only gained in team sports, but in recreational activities on a fully accessible playground. I think it's important for their social development to have the ability to get up on the equipment and play in their wheelchairs is so important because there was a time when he was in elementary school where he wasn't able to play on the playground and he his teachers helped provide a little box of army men and he would sit in the dirt and play with the army men and a lot of times he was by himself and that kind of defeats the whole purpose of recess and the social interaction that's gained from recess. There you go. Since Coleman has started participating in community activities, his parents have noticed a change in his self-confidence and his attitude towards trying new things. The independence is now kind of self-motivating rather than us pushing. He, he's kind of pulling us in some ways, so it's uh, refreshing. The physical benefits of active play and recreational activities include improvement in strength, endurance, and weight. Managing weight due to the intellectual and physical differences in children with spina bifida can prove challenging, but the rewards are improved health and quality of life. His weight was too much. When he was 10, he weighed more than 100 pounds. I had to carry him to put him in the car, to get him out of the car. Then they told me at the hospital that he had to lose weight, so I said to myself, oh, how am I gonna do this? So I told Alexis, you're gonna have to start eating normally. Low in calories, low in fats. Well, Alex made great changes. He and his family implemented great changes, not only with his diet, but also with his activities. And he participates in a buddy league basketball team and baseball team where they have an assistant assisting them with the activities. The social skills learned in team sports and recreational activities serve as building blocks for crossing more of life's bridges. Graduating from high school, attending college and or going to work. These are all major transitions for any young person. Moving to Houston was a big, big deal because um, I'm from the country, way out in the country. And um, just not having my family right there um, was a big growing experience for me because, you know, I, I could always call them and say, you know, I need help doing this or whatever, but you know, I kind of had to depend more on myself to do things. Kimberly has a Bachelor of Science degree with majors in criminal justice and psychology and a minor in biology. She has transitioned from home to college to community, but not without a few bumps along the way. Kimberly had to learn what she could and could not do in each new environment, from driving to handling her finances to taking care of her personal needs all steps towards leading a fulfilling, independent life. For the individual with spina bifida, the road map of life from childhood to adolescence to adulthood depends on a team. A team made up of family, physicians, educators, and other healthcare professionals. It's a partnership of care that begins at birth until the individual takes the lead in their own life fulfilling their dreams as well as those of their parents. I think the message is that your, your child with spina bifida, before the spina bifida, is, is a child that needs the same things any other kids need. My hopes and dreams for him are just for him to become an independent teenager. Just try not to be, to get frustrated because it will come, it, they will take that responsibility. A los niños. I would like to tell the kids to go forward. And to the families, support your kids in every way they need to be supported. As these children cross each bridge along life's journey, they teach us, just as we teach them. 
No one map fits the journey for every family traveling the challenging roads of individuals with spina bifida. However, with motivation, education, and encouragement, these children are successfully participating in life, crossing one bridge at a time.